Excellent. Today is Wednesday, February 1st, and I'm excited to be here at WebChat with Minnesota Adult Education. Excited to see all of you here today. Uh, in today's session, we're going to, uh, after introductions and welcome, we're going to talk through a couple, uh, through some announcements, share, uh, talk about accountability, assessment, grants and funding, transitions, high school equivalency, professional development, and make sure we have time for your questions as well. So a pretty packed agenda today. Let's start off with some introductions. My name is Brad Haskamp. I'm the State Director of Adult Education here at the Minnesota Department of Education. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jody. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jody Versa. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Program Quality Specialist on the team. And I'll hand it over to Julie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Danko. Pronouns are she and her. I'm the transition specialist at the Department of Education, and I'll hand it over to Astrid. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Astrid Leiden. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the professional development specialist on the team, and I'll turn it over to Brandy. Good afternoon. My name is Brandy Logan, and I am the high school equivalency and accountability specialist with the team, and I'm going to turn it over to Neil. Hello, everyone. My name is Neil Allard. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I am the Records, Communications, and Administrative Support Specialist. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Neil. Uh, great team to be working with. So let's kick off with some announcements today. First, we'd want to uh, share with you that uh, the Department of Employment and Economic Development, we often refer to them as DEED, they have an effort with digital inclusion through their Office of Broad Broadband Development that we want to share with you. And this is really looking to connect all Minnesotans to internet service, both affordability, device access, and digital skills. Um, and so those three aspects of digital inclusion work together to uh, help ensure a digitally equitable Minnesota where all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation um, in our society, in our democracy, and in our economy. We do have a link in the chat. If you uh, you can um, that you can put in the chat, uh, or you can see in the chat the link to the Deed uh, uh, website where you can learn more about this effort. Then, if you go to the next slide. Um, and there's a couple things in particular that you might want to check out there. One, there's uh, establish a digital connection com uh, committee, and you can register that by March 15th. And this, um, and there's also mini grants available for these uh, digital connection committees. Also, the, with the Office of Broadband Development, you can provide some feedback on their digital equity plan. Um, and also, you can find a committee near you um, and ask how you could get involved. So again, check out more about this in the uh, web, uh, in the Deed website. Then we're going to transfer into some accountability message. Okay. So with IET classes and SID, we just want to make sure that you're that those are appropriately marked. So only those classes that are part of an IET approved by MDE can be checked as IET and SID. Um, so we have a request for you. Please run the desk audit report to see what classes are labeled IET. And you can see that on the third page. I have a, a chat uh, or on the next slide, you can see more details there. And you can, uh, um, we ask that if you run that desk audit report and see some classes that are marked as IET that are not MDE approved IET classes that you uncheck that class. Also, you might say, oh, wait, we have some IET classes that were MDE approved and they're not appearing on the report. So you can then also go and make sure those classes are marked appropriately as IET. And in the chat, we do have some links. Thanks, uh, Neil, for sharing those to the SID Help Desk article. And if you're curious about like, how do I apply to become an MDE approved IET program, you can uh, click on the IET approval form and instructions page there to learn more. 
And then when you pull up your desk audit on page three, you'll see on the left hand side, there's where you can see the classes that are labeled as IET. And we can see here that this uh, with these classes that look, those all do look like they might be appropriate IET classes. And then we at MDE would check and make sure that we have the approval form for those classes. If you see any classes there that were not approved by MDE to be IET classes or things like ESL class, um, ESL class three, um, then that, that, those are telling signs that those should be unchecked as IET classes. Let's go to the next slide. And um, at the uh, fall manager meeting, we unveiled the new measurable skill gains or MSG options. Um, so there's MSG three, which is post-secondary transcript where an individual earns 12 or more post-secondary credit hours through an IET program. Uh, then there's the progress towards milestones, MSG4, where an employer evaluated outcomes are achieved by the student in either a workplace liter literacy class or an IET class. In addition, we have the passage of occupational exam or demonstration of progress attaining technical or occupational skills, um, IE, or that's MSG5, and that is only for those that earn uh, certificates um, or pass exams according to that in an IET program. And you and please note that your outcomes for these students can go all the way back to July of 2022. Um, so we, we just want to make sure that you're aware of that. And Eric, you asked a question in the chat, does an IET class need to be approved once or annually? It has to be approved once, but if there are any significant changes beyond that, we do ask that you resubmit it. And we do often look at those and like Julie says, it is preferable that you could do it annually and you can just take the IET form and update the things that need to be updated as needed. Let's go to the next slide. So I wanna hear from you. So in the chat, we're gonna have you chime in. Does anyone currently have any students working towards or that have earned an MSG3, meaning that they are working to earn 12 or more hours, uh, and you'll document that or show evidence of that through a post-secondary transcript. Um, any, um, anyone have any students that are working on MSG3 or that you think you'll have students this year that will earn an, uh, an MSG through this 12 or, 12 or more post-secondary credit hours? Not seeing anyone in the chat that's uh, that has anyone working towards an MSG three. Care, uh, Meg, you're saying that you need that clarification on credit hour. Yep. So we have that from uh, M, uh, Minnesota State. So we encourage you to talk with your post secondary partners and have them confirm. Does this count as twelve post secondary credit hours? In Mankato, you do have students working towards that with welding. Thank you, uh, Karen and Mary Kate. And Julie, you're saying that you you believe your agency will, but not your specific program. Excellent. Let's go on to the next slide. The next new MSG is MSG4, and this is for uh, folks who are working a lot with employers and that with the employer, there's some established uh, milestones that and participants who have a satisfactory or better progress reports uh, report from the employer towards those established milestone um, can earn that MSG4. And um, so this could, is primarily for workplace literacy programs, but it could be in an IET program if it's closely connected with an employer. Does anyone have any students working toward MSG4? Especially looking towards some of our, our programs that are working with employers or doing workplace literacy programming. Let's go on to the next slide. We're just going to do a little bit more about progress towards milestones. So I know we get questions about who, how do you develop those uh, milestones? So you need to create those milestones with the employer. Um, this can't be an, an adult education or ABE defined milestone on its uh, that the program defines on its own. Uh, you would identify the goals of the instruction, academic employability, digital literacy, and or any other mutually agreed upon employee milestones. And they should be developed before the programming starts. 
and that the uh, adult education provider and the employer need to agree on how that accomplishment will be measured. And usually it's the employer that has to verify that that, that, ha that the accomplishment has been achieved. Not seeing anyone that's working towards MSG4 in the chat. Okay, good to know. Let's move on to uh, the next slide. And then finally, MSG5, Occupational Exam or Demonstration of Skills. Um, any This is for participants who successfully pass an, ex an exam that's required for a particular occupation and or uh, for, uh, progress towards attaining technical or occupational skills as evidenced by trade-related benchmarks like knowledge-based exams. So it looks like in Mankato, they have some work towards MSG5 that is happening. Um, in DOC as well, and in OSSEO, um, if their IET is approved, Rochester as well. Excellent. So it's good to see that there's quite a few programs working on this MSG. Question from the chat, could MSG, MSG4, the, the milestones, be done in food service jobs? Yes, it can be done with food service jobs, MSG4, those progress towards milestones. Excellent. So Chelsea's talking about their boiler operator program with MSG5, and Julie's talking about their at the International Institute, they have the nursing assistant program. Excellent. Okay, well, let's move on here. So just um, as a note, the, so you can see here the MSG345 and which type of program does it work for? So in, it doesn't work for general adult education classes, but they, they can work for IET classes and MSG4 can work for workplace literacy programs. So that's important to know. Um, are there any questions or additional comments about the new MSG options? So Eric is saying that they're planning to um, planning to work towards this if their IET is approved. Um, and then they ask if the, uh, Eric says, can we go back to fall and count the MSGs if we get the IET approved now? And that the answer to that is yes, Eric. Um, you can go back to July of 2022, even if you just are submitting that IET approval form now. We understand that normally we'd like that to be approved, uh, approved in advance, but we know there's some timeline. It takes us a while to approve the forms and um, and as long as it was work, uh, operating according to expectations, then that, that would be fine um, with the delayed approval. Yep, to have that, uh, to go back and mark MSG fives from before. We have a question in the chat. Who would we talk to if we want to learn more about setting up MSG4 with local businesses? Great question, Sarah. So I think uh, you would start with talking with probably me from, from the team, uh, or you could reach out to anyone at the Minnesota Department of Education adult education team. But largely, uh, I would uh, I and then I would bring in folks from the team to really help talk through any, any of those MSG4 uh, questions that you might have. And I just put my email in the chat, Sarah. Any other questions about the new MSG options? Okay, not seeing any, but don't worry, we'll have time for Q&A later on. Let's go on to the next slide. Also at the fall manager meeting, we did share about employment and wage outcome by consortia. So we looked at, uh, we shared with you employment six months after exiting adult education, median quarterly wages, and employed one year after exiting adult education. And we did post that on mnabe.org as well. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And just so you can remember what those look like, hopefully you're, you're taking a look at these, but they it gave a couple of reports and listed every consortium. We don't have this information down to the provider level, just to the consortium level, if you're a multi uh, provider consortium. And so you can see some of the data there, the Minnesota adult education total, as well as information by consortium. And if we go to the next slide, we can see the report for one year after exiting adult education. So let's go to the next slide after this. 
So I'm curious, since we've shared this information with you in November, have you had ch a chance to look through that data? Do you have any thoughts about what about your consortium's outcomes or about the statewide outcomes? Um, are you using those outcomes? And if so, how are you using those outcomes? If you're not using them yet, how might you use those outcomes? Um, and the reason we're asking is, you know, it takes some time for us to put that report together. So we want to make sure it's useful or we maybe would discontinue uh, creating those reports if folks don't find them useful or if folks are not using them. Anyone have any thoughts to share? Please share in the chat um, or you can click to raise your hand and we can uh, hear from you if you have a if you have something you'd like to share verbally instead. Tracy, you're talking about using it in narratives. Excellent. Yeah, for grant applications, the five-year narrative, federal grant application workshop, a lot of those, those are very helpful. Patrick, uh, useful in grant applications or to share with partners? Absolutely. Karen, you're using it when you write grants. Okay, good to know. Okay. Well, that's helpful. Um, if you haven't taken a look at that um, yet, I um, I will share in the chat here um, in just a second the link to those reports. If you want to find them yourself, if you have, if you forgot about them, or if you didn't uh, get them from the uh, Minnesota uh, from the fall manager meeting, so uh, I will put the link in the chat, and you can see all of our information from the fall manager meeting there. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for that additional data in the chat and that feedback. I really appreciate that. Let's go on to the next slide then. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jody. Jody. All right. Thank you, Brad. So we also just wanted to remind folks that another um, tool you have to understand more about your accountability data is our MNABE report card. So the most recent report card is the 2021-2022 report card, which uh, we emailed out a few months back now. You can also find it on our MNABE.org website, and I'm going to stick that link in the chat. Um, we did want to just acknowledge that um, some smart folks out there uh, in the group discovered that there was an error on this uh, report card this year. Um, it was only on one of the tables, the table specific to measurable skill gains for ABE students. And we decided it wasn't worth it to uh, redo it and put out a new one because it was a relatively small um, error. Um, but just in case any of the rest of you noticed um, that when you pull your own data, that your um, number of students who made a gain is a little bit different than what is reported on this table, that you are right, what you see in SID is correct. And that was a mistake on our end. Also, we just want to remind you that there is no program improvement process associated with this data in the 2022 report card. Uh, and we also want to remind you that there will be some kind of program improvement process associated with data from the upcoming uh, report card um, that will be for 22-23 program year data. So on the next slide is just a little reminder or more information about what we mean when we say a program improvement process. Uh, those of you who've been around in the field for a while might remember this. Uh, we have taken a hiatus from having program improvement during the pandemic years because we all had far too many other ways that uh, we were focused on improving our programming. Um, but starting up, in 23-24, we will be starting another program improvement process. And what that means is that on that report card, uh, which should be released 
late summer or early fall of 2023. Um, consortia that have low performance on the accountability measures on the report card, uh, including measurable skill gains and post-testing rates may be required to participate in program improvement. So if your consortium ends up with low, uh, low performance, and if as a result, you are required to participate in program improvement, that probably means coming to a workshop, doing some planning, and having some communication and technical assistance from our MDE team. So we just wanna give you a heads up that that process um, is starting up again this upcoming program year after a couple of years off. And then on the next slide, just one more kind of reminder about accountability in general and your data. We, you know, we use our data system, SID, as uh, the main place where we track and um, and analyze data about our programs. And the SID staff are putting on a useful webinar uh, coming up in here in a couple of weeks. So we want to encourage you to think about um, attending that webinar to um, think more about your data in SID and um, making sure that you know, you know everything you need to know about what you can do in SID to manage data. And Neil put the link to that in the chat. Thank you, Neil. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Astrid to talk about assessment. Excellent. Thanks, Jody. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, first, we wanted to remind everyone to please complete the statewide CASA and TABE usage survey. That survey was sent out on the 23rd, 23rd of January by Neil to consortium managers. Um, and this is a survey to get us um, some hard numbers about which tests and which forms of tests are being used out in the field. And this information will be used by our assessment training team to make decisions about training. We'll also use this information to make decisions about um, bulk purchases for the state. So you have the option to either complete the survey for your whole consortium, or depending on your consortium structure and size, it might make more sense for you to forward it on to others in your consortium who would be able to answer the questions for um, portions of your consortium. So please make sure to complete that survey by February 10th. Great, let's go to the next slide. We also want to take this opportunity with you all here to get some information about your assessment training needs. Our state assessment team really needs your input as they are planning testing training for this spring and summer. So we're actually going to ask you to um, take a couple minutes right now. Uh, Neil has put a link to the assessment training needs form in the chat. I ask you to go to that form and take a couple of minutes to respond to the questions about how many of staff you have who need um, various types of assessment training and just use your, use your best guess and also getting your input on the best time for staff to attend um, specific testing trainings. Now, if there are multiple people here from your consortium, maybe you can do a little coordination in the chat if you're a consortium manager and you see others um, from your consortium who might want to respond to the survey for portions of their consortium, you can communicate with them. We're gonna take just about two or three minutes to do this. You can open up a new window. And once you've responded, if you can let me know that you're back by just putting a note in the chat. So I will be quiet and let you respond to those questions.
What's her, I so don't go know. to the microphone. Mm -hmm. Click on that. Test your sound. Oh, wait, down. Yep, that. Okay, I'm seeing a few folks chatting that they have finished responding. We'll give another minute for a few more to finish and then we'll move on. Thank you so much for taking the time to give us feedback. That will be really helpful as Marty and Linda are planning the statewide trainings. Okay, great. Hopefully folks are have finished or close to, to finish um, responding to that survey. Right, let's go to the next slide. Want to make sure that everybody saw that there is an opportunity tomorrow to attend a TABE online review and discussion. We know that there have been some questions and challenges around uh, computer-based testing. And so our assessment team has coordinated a webinar that will be led by TABE representatives. This is an opportunity to get an overview of TABE online and um, an overview of uh, using the DRC Insight portal to administer tests. You can come to get some general information and come with your questions. And Neil has put the registration link in the chat there for you. And then finally, uh, we did want to take the chance to get some input from you all around computer-based NRS testing, so CASAs and TABE testing, and hear whether you are using computer-based testing, either on-site or remote in your program. How has it been going? What have been some of the barriers to starting or implementing computer-based testing? It's um, going slower than we had, had hoped, and um, a little bit slower here in Minnesota than in other states. So we want to hear from you. What are what have some of the barriers been and what support would help you um, to to launch or more effectively use computer based testing at your program? So you can um, put your thoughts in the chat. You can raise your hand. We can unmute you. Sally talks about um, how complicated it has been for, with, with CASA, so maybe a, a review session like we're doing with TAID might be helpful. Christy says um, they're using on-site computer-based testing for all their listening. Once they got it figured out, uh, they love it, and that's exactly what I've heard from, from Linda Keller as well. Carly's echoing that thought that it was a big hurdle to get started, but once people have it up and running, it's great. Marilyn says online CASAS is great, saves a lot of time. Angie also mentions that it's complicated to get, get up and running, just need to carve out the time to do this. Might be nice to have a training on setting it up. So Marty and Linda, I'm hearing that maybe some additional support, um, particularly around the CASAS computer-based testing um, might be helpful to folks. And what I'm seeing is primarily that it's the it's the setup and getting over that hump of figuring that out and finding the time to do that. Um, C says they're using online and remote. It's been going great. They're helping train all the other programs in the consortium as well as other consortiums. 
Great. Okay, well, this is really helpful. We will save the chat. Please um, keep your reflections coming. Again, if you have um, requests for support or training that would make this easier for you, um, please share those in the chat. You can also contact um, Marty directly with your ideas. I'll put her email in the chat. Um, and we will be in touch with um, some additional supports for you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, at this point, I'm going to turn things back to Jody to talk about grants and funding. Great. Thank you, Astrid. So first off, when we we're thinking about grants and funding, we just want to give you some reminders about five-year narratives. Um, if you are new to the field and you haven't heard of five-year narratives before, what this is, it is, it is a process for current ABE consortia or new ABE consortia to uh, receive authorization or reauthorization to continue receiving annual grants of state and federal or state ABE dollars. Um, these are just some screenshots from different um, narratives that have been submitted in the last few years. I think Duluth wins the prize for the most beautiful um, cover photo for obvious reasons. Um, so we just want to remind folks on the next slide who are in the current narrative cohort. So there's a group of uh, consortia, a group of grantees every year that are sort of next on deck to submit narratives. I know that all of you in this cohort um, are aware of that, and I know you are working um, on your narratives. So there are six consortia this year who are working on narratives that are due on June 1st. Um, and for you all, the next step after that June 1st date is that your narrative will be reviewed. And then in summer or fall, uh, we will set up a visit uh, to talk about um, the results and the feedback of your narrative. Um, and it's possible this time we could do some of those in person. We could also do some of them virtually. So yep, shout out to these folks who are doing a lot of work currently um, this year. The next group of people that I want to um, give a heads up to is the 2024 narrative cohort. So these are the consortia that are next uh, up uh, that are required to submit narratives on June, on June 1st of 2024. Uh, Brandy and I are currently working on some email communication out to this group of consortia to give you more information about what's coming next, but we just want to make sure that you know at this point, uh, when you are the upcoming year narrative cohort, your first step in that process is to review the current year narratives. So uh, this group of consortia on this slide, you will be asked to um, provide at least one staff person, preferably more than one staff person, to review the 2023 narratives. Um, if you are in this group, please do um, put a hold the date on your calendar for Tuesday, June 27th of this year. That is when we will do an in-person uh, meeting to talk about narrative reviews. Like I say, there's an email uh, underway uh, out to this group with more information, but just giving you a heads up to be watching for that at this point. Then, um, shifting gears a little bit, we want to uh, continue the discussion that has been happening a lot this year. Uh, we know that uh, many of you are asking this question this year, um, and we know that this question is more difficult to answer this year than maybe than in any other year um, in our careers for most of us. I want to make sure you know that no one, uh, in, including those of us who work from the M on the MDE team, no one has an exact answer to this question at this point, uh, but we do want to spend a little bit of time, again, just um, helping you kind of wrap your head around what are the different um, data points um, that you might use to try to help you predict and sort of what is the state of the state in terms of you know, what's going on at the statewide level and how, how might you use that information as you are trying to answer this question. 
So Brad and I are going to share some more information uh, with you here that we hope will be useful and relevant. First off, I just want to acknowledge this is not the first time we have talked about this. We started uh, talking about it back in November at the fall manager meeting. Um, and we spent quite a we spent a good chunk of time on that day uh, really digging into this issue um, and really trying to provide sort of the baseline of all the background information that you need to try to make predictions. We are not going to take the time to do that again today, um, but we do want you to, um, if, if it seems useful to you, we want you to be able to look back at the slides from that presentation. Um, Neil has put those in the chat, so we hope that those are useful to you as a reference. Then a couple of weeks ago um, on January 17th, uh, Atlas hosted a webinar specifically for adult ed administrators where there was um, discussion about planning and budgeting for the coming year. Um, there is a link to the recording of that event. We do encourage you to go back and take a look at that. That was an opportunity where um, we shared as the MDE team some of the same information from the fall manager meeting, but then a couple of um, ABE managers from across the state talked specifically about what that information means for their programs and their budget, which I think is, um, is really useful potentially to hear. Um, and in general, we encourage you to be in touch with each other, um, with managers of other programs. As you are asking these questions, we hope you do consider each other really important resources in addition to our MDE team. So for today, um, we first of all wanted to just acknowledge some things that we're not going to spend time on today. Um, we're not going to specifically talk about the four components of state ABE funding. Um, and we're not going to talk any more about sort of estimating best case, worst case scenarios, but we want to mention those because we did spend time on those things at the fall manager meeting in November. So if you've got questions about those or want to remind yourself of what that was all about, uh, please do take a look at the, at the fall manager meeting slides um, to kind of have some resources and reminders about that. So for today, on the next slide, we want to um, think about sort of where we are at and what the starting points are for um, a little bit of you know conversation and information sharing today. First of all, just making sure we all know exactly, understand exactly uh, what we are talking about and what data is sort of important in this conversation. So just to reiterate, I hope this first bullet is not news to anybody, but just to make sure that you uh, realize and recognize that hours from this current contact hour period, so hours from May 1st of 2022 through April 30th, 2023, will be used for calculating next year's funding. Remember, we took a couple of years off from using actual hours because of the pandemic, and we won't be doing that anymore. The second thing to know is that the total amount of state funding available looks like it'll be similar to what we have for this current year. So the implication of those two things is that the total amount of funding remains the same. Contact hours are down statewide at this point. So, so it's a fair assumption that the overall total of contact hours will be down from where it was pre-COVID, which is the number we've been using for the last couple of years. So that will result in the contact hour rate going up. So that is sort of a starting point for today's conversation. We do know, or we can reliably predict that the contact hour rate is going to go up for next year. On the next slide, though, we, we have to acknowledge that just knowing that is, is, quite, is not quite enough um, to do all of the math. Um, so next, we want to kind of think about um, the different 
pieces of uh, data, uh, specifically about hours, that um, you will be considering as you think about trying to answer this question of next year's funding. So first of all, we want to acknowledge that the comparison that we have to be making as we think about predicting funding, we have to compare hours from table A1, which remember that was a new table that we started um, during the pandemic to really capture the year's worth of hours right before the pandemic started. So the dates of that are March 14th, 2019 to March 30th, 2020. And we used that set of hours three different times for three different fiscal years. Now we wanna compare that set of hours to the current hours within this current contact hour reporting period. So that's the one we're currently in, May 1st of last year to April 30th of this year. We wanna note what's tricky about comparing those two years worth of hours is actually they're not the same on the calendar. So while so far we have been able to do a month to month comparison, we can compare May 2019 to May 2022. We can do that all the way through May to December of 2019 compared to 2022. However, just note that starting with March of this year, that's when that month to month comparison doesn't work anymore because those table A1 hours started in the middle of March in 2019. So we just want to give you a heads up about that, that if you're comparing month to month, that's a good idea. But a couple months from now, that will not work anymore. Then you'll have to think about it a little differently. But for now, um, that is what we are doing. Yep, so on the next slide, uh, we have an update for you on sort of the state of where contact hours are at um, currently across the state. So this is a comparison between 2019 hours and 2022 hours. We now have, uh, how many months is this? One, two, eight eight months worth of hours to total up. Um, so you can see that in 2019, in those eight months, we had about 2.8 million hours statewide. In 2022, in those same eight months, we had a little over 2 million hours. So we've been thinking about this in terms of how big is the decline, um, and that represents a 27% decline which for those of you who have you know, been attentive all along as we've been talking about this the last couple of months, um, is that that decline is staying pretty flat. Back in November when we started talking about this, I believe we said at that point it looked like a 28% decline. Now we're looking at a 27% decline. I think it's again safe to predict that that decline won't change a lot in the last few months worth of data. It could. Um, but it looks like it's staying pretty steady. So on the next slide, what we want to be sure that you know about that is that um, it, it will be useful for you to take a look at your consortium's hours in that same period and compare to this statewide total of hours and the decline statewide. So this uh, graphic, which I know some of you have seen before, but just to make sure that everybody has you know, got the information you need, what this is illustrating is that we believe at this point that across the state, most consortia are down in hours. So you can't necessarily assume that a decline in hours will result in a decrease in funding. Instead, the data point you should be looking at is, is your decrease in funding similar to, less than, or greater than the statewide decrease? So, that, so the chart on the right sort of illustrates that if that blue bar um, represents statewide hours, those hours are down from the table A1 hours. But if consortium A, which is the orange bar, is down more, the decline is greater than the statewide hours, that could predict a decrease in funding. That gray bar, that's consortium B, that consortium is also down in hours, but less than the statewide total, that will predict possibly an increase in funding. So that's sort of um, 
starting starting points um, and kind of catching everybody up to um, to where we are statewide. And then I'm going to turn it over to Brad at this point. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to turn it over to Brad to keep going with this conversation. Thanks, Jody. Yep, no uh, no questions in the chat yet. So um, yeah. And following up on with some additional information about our state adult education or ABE funding, there's just some caveats that we should that we just want to remind you about and make sure that we talk through a little bit more. Um, our contact hour revenue growth cap, our gross revenue per contact hour cap, our service disruption adjustment for decreased contact hour revenue, and consortium ABE aid allocations to member providers. Um, so let's move into this next one. And so the first one is our contact hour revenue growth cap. And so that means that, you know, um, from one year to the next, that your um, state ABE growth uh, contact hour revenue cannot exceed growth of more than 11% or $10,000, which if whichever is greater from one year to the next. So let's say you're that consortium that's actually, you're growing since, uh, since 2019, 2020, or maybe your decline is more like 10% instead of 27%, the state average. What that might mean is that you'll have growth in terms of your contact hour revenue, and you might end up hitting this cap um, um, in, a, in a situation like that. And that is actually a, a good thing in that you're getting the most possible money um, that you can um, from uh, in terms of state AB funding from one year to the next. So um, just note that that's kind of a, a good situation in that you're getting as much money as possible through the formula. So if you're doing really well contact hours wise, you could hit this 11% growth cap. Let's go on to the next caveat. The next caveat is the $22 gross revenue per contact hour cap. So this is when we uh, total all four parts of a consortium state AB funding, and we put that together. And if that, that total amount cannot exceed more than $22 per contact hour, and that, uh, that current amount is set in state statute. So in this uh, current fiscal year, nine out of 38 consortia did hit this cap. And we can assume and we can say that with a decrease in total contact hours, more consortia are likely to hit that cap in the next year, in the upcoming fiscal year. Let's go to the next slide. And we do see this, uh, we do see that as potentially problematic and Literacy Action Network has seen that as problematic as well. And many of you have told us that you see that current $22 cap is problematic. So there is potential state legislation this session uh, to raise that gross revenue per contact hour cap from $22 to $30. Um, that was in the governor's budget. And so there have been bills in both the Senate and the House in, in St. Paul to raise that cap to $30 an hour. And I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful friends over at Literacy Action Network. Susie, uh, do you want to share anything more about any legislative efforts? Hi, everybody. Hey, this Susie. Is Susie. Hey, and if Wendy, if you can unmute yourself too. Um, we've been working on the three main messages that we want to share as part of our platform. And uh, we definitely are getting good input from our friends, all of you. So um, I'm not sure, Wendy, if you're able to unmute and share the, or even where you can go on Literacy Action Network on our website to find our draft or our most updated, you know, three main points that we're going to use as our platform. Um, yeah, I can go ahead and pop it in the chat, Susie. You okay, share. perfect. Yep. And so if you click on there, you'll see um, we're working with our lobbyists and uh, making sure that the message that we're that we would like her to carry forward is being carried forward. We're also working on um, our day on the hill with um, in partnership with IMABE. So we want to make sure that our voices are heard and we have exposure um, to anyone who walks into the Capitol to, to celebrate ABE and to help promote what we're trying to do. Um, so our main platforms are making sure that if K-12 is getting a bump, that we understand that the funding is different, but we wanted funded mandates so that, you know, people who are struggling in their programs to fill vacancies, that districts have the option if there's more funding behind ABE. Um, 
I don't know what Dwayne is asking. I'm not smart enough for that, Brad. Maybe you are. Good question, Dwayne. Um, I, I don't know that number off the top of my head. I have to admit, I'm not sure, Jody, if you have that number either in terms of the total statewide ABE contact hours. Jody, Jody of course, will Thanks. look it up because she's smarter than this. So um, you'll be getting more information from Literacy Action Network from Wendy um, about maybe who your legislators are in your area where you can connect with them on the platforms that we're hoping will um, move forward. But I know at the fall web chat, I think Jody went through that the 13 and a half or 14 steps that it takes to pass. Uh, a bill and to make things go, um, our hopes and dreams go into an action item. Um, Wendy, did you want to add anything? No, not at this time. That sounds good, Susie. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Susie. Yep we're, work, um, yep, we're just working with what the governor is presenting right now, and then our lobbyists are making sure that as part of, you know, the main points that we're part of those um, sub subheadings under each of those pieces. Excellent. Thanks, Susie. We yep, did get and, questions and in the chat, but this is a question yeah. more for me than for you, Susie. So don't worry, Perfect. you don't have to answer that one. Good. Okay, asked... bye. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Kirsten asks, is the federal government has decided that we're operating under a pandemic emergency through um, some dates selected in May 2023. Could MDE or AB reconsider the use of Table 1 this year in hopes it will buy some time to work on the contact hour cap and the uh, and the com coming year. And my answer to that is that is very, very, very unlikely. Um, if the federal government, if the government, uh, federal government declares a pandemic emergency through, uh, through 2023, it still would not likely mean that we would go back to using table A1 hours. However, I will say that, you know, it's not, it, it's not something that we are, we've been really clear on or anything that we've really had a chance to discuss yet. Um, so that it's, I would say that that's extremely unlikely. Um, however, it's not something that's been discussed yet. And thanks to Jody for sharing in the chat that our statewide hours for table A1 were 4.4 million or uh, precisely it was 4,470,459 contact hours from March 14th, 2019 to March 13th, 2020, that table A1 period. Thanks, Jody. So let's go into the next slide. So Kirsten, what you're talking a about a little bit more might be considered service disruption or what, what is officially the service disruption adjustment of contact hour revenue. So this service disruption adjustment may be available for ABE grantees that see a significant decrease in state contact hour revenue. And that's at least 10% in decreased contact hour revenue for a consortium or at least 15% decreased revenue for a program or a provider. And this, the couple of factors here, as long as the service disruption was caused by a factor outside of the outside of the control of the program, so there, COVID is a, a factor outside of the control of the program, and reasonable actions were taken to avoid the loss of contact hours. So both of those factors would need to be applicable in order to use the service disruption adjustment of contact hour revenue. If a service disruption adjustment is approved, this would add an estimated 50% of the consortium's lost contact hour revenue. And you can see more details there in uh, a Minnesota state statute, uh, either 124D.531 subdivision 10 or 124D.518 subdivision 4A. So there's some question, uh, there's some information there. Before I kind of, I, Tracy, I see your hand up, but let me go to the next slide because I do have some additional information about the service disruption that I just wanted to share. So with the service disruption, there is an actual application here that a consortium needs to fill out in order to have that service disruption adjustment applied. So the application timeline for any consortia who may hit the gross revenue per contact hour cap 
that application process will open after the legislative session finishes. So if you're currently convinced that you're going to be at that $22 cap, and if that cap doesn't get adjusted, you could let us know, at, you could start to apply after the legislative session finishes. Now, in case there is a new statute that raises the cap, that might be more questionable um, if, you, if you know that you will hit that cap. But again, that you can apply at that point if that applies to you. For everybody else, all other consortia must wait into, uh, to apply until after we run the initial calculation of funding. Um, and that's typically done in mid-June, uh, sometime between mid-June and early July. So that you must apply, and that is the timing of when you can apply as a consortium. And then the next uh, item, and then we'll go into questions here. With that service disruption adjustment, if one or more consortia apply and are approved for this service disruption adjustment after the initial calculation is released, we will need to run a new calculation and that will redistribute the, the total state funding for all consortia. So the new calculation will increase revenue for those consortia that are approved for service disruption or the service disruption adjustment. And then to offset though, that means there will be a small decrease in revenue for the other consortia because remember, our state allocation doesn't change, our total state allocation doesn't change with these applications. It just determines how we split the pizza or how we split the pie. So if one entity's can, like pot, uh, slice of pizza gets a little bigger, that means that this all the other slices need to be a little bit smaller um, and vice versa. As one's, one slice gets a little smaller, that means everyone else's slice gets a little bit bigger. We all have to share the pizza and the pizza is determined, the size of the pizza is determined by the legislature. At MDE, we just get told how to cut it up. <laughs> um, I know there's some questions. Jody, do you mind helping me with some of the questions that are currently in the chat as, as they uh, pertain to the service disruption clause or earlier clauses that we've talked about? Yeah, I believe, Brad, that there's a couple of questions in the chat that I think are um, Literacy Action Network questions specific to um, how, what are the most effective ways to do legislative advocacy. So we will let uh, Susie or other land folks um, maybe reply in the chat. Oh, yep, looks like Susie will email. I, maybe Susie, it would be nice if you put your email in the chat so that other folks who are interested in doing legislative advocacy could reach out directly to Susie. Uh, and also the other uh, co-chair with Susie of the uh, Legislative Committee of LAN is Scott Helland, who isn't um, able to uh, be here today. And other than that, um, I don't think there are any questions in the chat, Brad, other than I know Tracy had her hand up. So I wonder if we could um, let Tracy ask her question at this point. Sounds great. Tracy Chase, do you have your, do you have a question? I, I sure do. Actually, I've got a couple of different questions. So um, what I'm wondering is um, if people's hours tank and it's like, okay, yep, they're, um, and they don't receive a service disruption clause, you know, they're, they're not uh, proof for that. Won't it take quite a few years to build back up? Because with that growth cap of only being able to grow at 10%, wouldn't it be where, so, so say if you had half of what you typically do, the next year you would be able to gain 10%. And so then the following year, you're still down and you're only going up by small increments. Am I correct in that thinking? Correct. Yes. You And, and the, uh, the, that's the contact hour revenue growth, the growth cap. So right. for the contact hour revenue portion, it's 11% or $10,000, whichever is greater. So yes, if, if, um, and there have been consortia that have done where they have had that year where they tank and then they've have had to slowly build back up over the next several years um so that is absolutely uh that is absolutely true that that can happen okay so then if a person is approved for the service disruption adjustment yep um would that be taken into consideration the following year in regards to the contact hours or would you still be at that low level for well, contact hours. Yeah, so if a service disruption adjustment is app approved and applied, that is their new 
con they get a new contact hour total that we work to create together uh, between MDE and the consortium. And that is like the new uh, total that would be used for future years as reference as well. Okay. And then did I misunderstand at our last get together that, um, you know, ABE gets what? 53 million, 54 million or whatever. And I know that some goes for the um, support services and all of that. Um, but say, let's just say 50 million for adult ed programs around the state. Mm -hmm. So yes. if the contact hours have really gone down, we yep. now have, you know, the majority of programs capped because of that $22. We only have a few programs that could actually increase by 11% or $10,000 yep. that if we don't make it to that 50 million, say, um, then whatever excess would then be put into the pot next year to be correct. Okay. Anything that is, and remember we hold the money that gets held is from, um, is from the gross revenue per contact hour cap. That twenty that that is currently set at twenty two dollars. Um, that that money, any money that is not used, then does get set aside for the future year. So typically, in a year, that's a very small amount of money for in terms of statewide total adult education funding. Um, if that number got much much larger, um, yeah, then that would just mean that there would be more that that additional amount of funding would be added to the pot next year, and that would have to be considered in the calculation for next year, the future years. Uh, uh, state adult education aid. Thank you. Yep, you've clarified. I appreciate it. Yep. Um, Brad, can I add another thought on this? Absolutely. Well, wow. those these are really good questions, Tracy, and I appreciate that you're bringing this up. There's an important thing to understand about the math problem here. That cap on the 11% growth cap does not apply to your total revenue. It only applies to the contact hour portion of your revenue. So if when a consortium is in the scenario of hitting the $22 per hour cap, the first part of the, the first part of the math is figuring out how much of each of the four components of aid does the consortium receive? Then those are totaled and then divided by contact hours to find out if you hit the cap. If you hit the cap, then that total amount is reduced and it could be reduced significantly for some programs this year. I know, Tracy, that that's kind of what you're looking at and what you're worried about, right? But keep in mind that what the math that we will be doing for next year to set that 11% growth in your contact hour revenue is to start with that initial number of actual revenue before the 22 actual contact hour revenue, like that chunk of the of that component of that first step of the formula, we will look at that number and add 11% or 10,000 to that for next year. We it won't be the starting point in that case would not be your total award after the $22 per hour cap. It would be that you couldn't capture more growth than what you would have had if you hadn't hit the $22 per hour cap. So now we're getting a little bit into the weeds, but I just do want to say that is an important point because I think you're envisioning a worst case scenario that's actually not possible. <laughs> it actually, that, that growth cap can be a problem, um, but not quite as devastating a problem as you were as you were thinking. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, looks like it does. Thank you for that clarification, Jody. Let's go to the next slide and, and talk about our fourth clause or caveat, I should say. Our fourth caveat is that one other thing that we do not control or that state statute does not define is how total amounts of state ABE funding get divided be, uh, be, uh, between consortium members. So state statute clearly outlines how much MDE provides uh, or allocates to each consortium. State statute does not define how each consortium, the fiscal agent uh, and its provide member, member providers, distribute flow funding 
uh, with each other or share funding with each other. So um, so that is something to keep in mind as well. So if you, you might want to take a look, what are your MOUs? What do you use as a formula? This might be a great time to re-examine that and make sure that that works for your consortium and your consortium members. How are you going, how are you divvying out that funding, your consortium's funding among each of you as providers from the fiscal agent and, and all the other providers? Let's go to the next slide. And we will provide some additional information for you. So um, in early March, uh, right now, we've just shared with you the up to December hours, because those are the, the contact hours for May to December are what are confirmed right now. Um, in early March, we can share an additional, uh, we'll share with you via email, an additional update that will include January hours. And in early April, we'll provide an additional email update that will include February hours. And then um, on May 3rd, that's when our next web chat with Minnesota adult education is and we'll provide another update at that point in time in terms of the contact hour are we still at that 27 percent or has it slightly adjusted from there so stay tuned i know we've taken some questions throughout and i know that in the chat there's been some discussion about uh lists of consortium managers um and contact lists uh beyond that though uh what other questions do you have about our funding Are there any other questions about the funding for the next fiscal year? Feel free to raise your questions in the chat or click to raise your hand and we can call on you. Not seeing anything at this time, but we will have Q&A at the beginning. So let's go move on. And I'm going to turn it over to Julie to talk about transitions. Thank you, Brad. And good afternoon, everyone. There is a lot happening in the world of transitions. So I'm going to uh, get started here with our online statewide training courses. Uh, we have piloted them the first six months and we're into our second month. So here's just a reminder that Healthcare Core is opened. Students can enroll at any time. Information is on that flyer. Um, and the other course, the, uh, the next course is Microsoft Office Specialist Certification Training. Onboarding sessions are scheduled during the months or the dates listed. Um, so people can join and onboard for that class at that time. And then the next two uh, uh, training courses have deadlines. Uh, they actually started, oh, I think it's two weeks ago in, in January. But learn, yeah, January 23rd, learners can still register if you get them registered by tomorrow. And uh, these are great courses, obviously, tease prep and paraprofessional para training. And then the next um, item I'd like to promote is a half day virtual development education. A Adult Basic Education Partnership Symposium. This is February 16th, 8.45 a.m. to 12.30, and it's going to be virtual. Um, and there are a lot of great uh, breakout sessions during this um, symposium. And you'll also, some of you are aware that there are going to be some changes to Minnesota State Developmental Education, and there will be an opportunity to hear from uh, the Minnesota State Administrator for the DevEd redesign at this event as well. So please do sign up. It's, it's, it's going to be a great symposium. Next slide. I also want to promote the Adult Career Pathways IET networking webinars. There will be three of them this year. We already had one in December and it was fantastic. Actually, it might've been the end of November. It's really a time to network with 
colleagues in the AB field across the state that are doing similar work that you are doing. Um, it's for teachers and administrators who, and you can look at the different career sectors that people are networking around. These are not like uh, webinars where you get information. These are very much discussion and networking. Um, so the next one will be February 7th. And then the final one will be April 19th. I also want to give everyone a heads up about the ability to benefit pilot. Um, we have an approved state plan that went through a federal office and ability to benefit is for students who are ready to start post-secondary and complete their high school equivalency diploma at the same time. There have been a series of webinars that some ABE providers have been participating in. Um, there will be another one February 13th, and this is more of an informational webinar where we will be grouping people with their uh, post-secondary institution or in different regions of the state uh, to get their questions um, answered. And just to discuss uh, what it's going to look like to kick this off in the fall of 2023. Again, this is a way for individuals to get that um, financial aid that they need to attend college and at the same time support them in completing their high school equivalency. Um, if you have questions about this pilot at all, you can always email me for more information. Next slide. And finally, the Nursing Assistant Knowledge and Skills Test Exam. Uh, we were able to get some free, uh, free CNA code for ABE learners who needed to test. That ends Friday, February 10th. For those programs that asked me for the codes, I'm just giving you a heads up that it's going in February 10th. Testers can actually test that day through February 10th, and then it will be cut off after um, that time. So just a reminder regarding that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandy on high and uh, talk about high school equivalency. Thank you, Julie. This is Brandy, and we just have some quick up-to-date information. If you go to the next slide, um, when you are sending any type of email, if you could please send that to the mde.abe email, that is manned by our team. So there are multiple eyes that are looking through that email. So try not to send any direct emails unless it's specified for the individual in their position. But if it's any kind of high school equivalency uh, regards, just make sure you're sending it to the MDE. Um, if it's an urgent email, try to put urgent in the subject line so we can do our best to try to expedite that. Um, another issue is our we wanted to address is making sure that everyone has up-to-date documentation. So if you have a printed the records request form or an age waiver form, please make sure that those are the most up to date that we have available on our website. You can also direct people to the website for them to download it electronically and fill out. But we are seeing older versions still coming through and we would prefer to try to get the newer versions out there. Um, that's just a quick recap of what's going on, but I'm going to introduce Melissa Holstead with GED next, and she's going to give you some updates on GED. So, Melissa. Thanks, Brandy. I appreciate that. Hopefully, everyone can hear me loud and clear. Uh, good afternoon. Happy first day of February. I hope 2023 has been great to all of you so far. And as I get started here today, I do want to make you aware that our annual GED conference will be held in New York City this year, uh, specifically Midtown Manhattan. And we will provide uh, the latest information about the GED program, as well as host panels, professional development workshops, and sessions covering topics such as marketing, corrections, student support, and test administration. 
uh, registration is actually um, already open and we already have information of about 35 of the sessions that we plan on delivering. More sessions and session descriptions will be added in the upcoming months. But if you want to learn more about this conference, you can go um, to this link that I'm going to post here in the chat for you. Uh, let's put that here. There you go. Uh, hopefully that went through. And next slide. Actually, I'm not sure if that did go through or not. Um, sorry, just one second here. There you go. You should be able to see that link now. Um, sorry, I'm operating from an airport right now, so I apologize. Um, so with regards to this next slide that's here, moving on, I want to point out that we at GED have worked on and done a lot since introducing the current version of the test, also known as the 2014 test. And as it indicates here on this slide, I mean, we've created multiple new tools, platforms, services. Uh, that includes GED.com, the, the student portal. And to that alone, we've made thousands of enhancements based on educator feedback and research uh, with learners. Um, also, when it comes to GED Manager, we built that for the 2014 test. And um, when we introduced it, it was pretty basic compared to all that it can do now. And that's because we've made thousands of changes to, um, to better help states and programs manage their programs and student information. Uh, also, we've introduced the GED Ready test, GED Ready Direct, which has been since now um, called GED Direct as well as GED Prep Connect. Uh, next slide. So I want to let you know that we will continue to make enhancements and work on new tools, platforms, and services. Uh, in fact, work has begun on a GED app. But I do want to point out that the price of the GED computer-based tests will be increasing on July 1st of this year by $6 a module. And also students that are not passing a subject will be eligible for one discounted retake, not two starting on July 1st as well. And just so you know, this is the first time since 2012 that we are increasing the price of the CBT GED test. And this is because we've experienced significant increases in costs over the past decade, especially over the last few years. Next slide. Uh, furthermore, as I wrap up here, we're going to redesign the educators and admins webpage, but we want to first learn from users how you're using it now and what works or doesn't work for you. So we are looking for some volunteers and we'll give you 25 GED Ready vouchers for one hour of your time. This session will be one on one. Someone from our team will be asking questions about the webpage, asking you to interact with the webpage. We are looking for super users all the way to folks who are brand new to GED. So if you are interested, please send me an email. I will post my um, email address in the chat. And the last thing I wanna remind you of today is the GED Ready Green promotion that started in the fall of last year. That uh, applies to any public tester who scores green on their GED Ready test, that they will receive an offer the same day their score is posted in their account. And that offer is if they schedule their GED test within 24 hours by clicking the schedule now button in their account, we will cover the cost of a retake in that subject if they don't pass. And they, they have 60 days to retake the test for free. So at this time, that is all from me. Thank you for all you do for our GED testers. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please don't hesitate to email me. Take care, everyone, and I will post my email address uh, here in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. I greatly appreciate you coming on and talking to everyone about those updates. If you can go to the next slide, please. Just a quick update about our HiSET implementation for the state of Minnesota. HiSET has changed companies from ETS to PSI, and this transition has generated some national disruptions. So we are still working on the piloting of HiSET in Minnesota and tentatively looking to launch that earlier this year. We do have some sites that have volunteered to continue with the high set pilot and becoming test centers. 
And of course, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me, Brandy Logan. Um, and my email has been posted in the chat as well here on the slide. And now I'm going to turn it over to Astrid for professional development. Great. Thanks, Brandy. So um, we are heading into the home stretch here with a few professional development updates and announcements. Just want to remind folks that um, all of the PD activities and events that I'm going to talk about can be found on our professional development calendar. And I think Neil is going to put that link into the chat for you. So that's where you can go to find out more information and register. First, I'm going to circle back to a discussion that we started at our fall managers meeting around the development of a Minnesota adult education professional development policy. So at that meeting, we shared some draft professional development requirements that had been developed over the past few years uh, by a subcommittee of our statewide professional development committee. And we asked you to um, discuss with colleagues and share your feedback with us via a Google form. Um, and then that was also shared with the, the field as a whole in a follow-up email. So thanks to everybody who took the time to provide your feedback on those draft requirements. The feedback was reviewed by a number of different groups. Our state staff team um, spent some time with the data, the statewide professional development committee, and then our administrator PD advisory team. And what we found um, was that there were a number of um, concerns around these requirements. So you expressed concern around the number of hours of required training and the timeline for completion that was being proposed. There were concerns about lack of funding to pay staff for training time, and then also possible impacts that additional requirements might have on hiring and retention. So we took that feedback and um, our various advisory groups worked to um, consider some adjustments to the proposed uh, requirements. So if you'll go to the next slide, Neil. Um, we have now developed some revised PD requirements. And um, so the, the first shift is around ABE Foundation. So with the revised requirements, um, this is the only new requirement that would be added in the policy, and that would be to complete ABE Foundations within 12 months of hire. And that timeline has been shifted from what was originally proposed. We originally proposed six months. We've shifted that to 12 months um, with encouragement for full-time staff um, to complete within the first uh, six months of hire. The um, trainings that are required before implementation stay the same. These are all required by currently existing policies. Um, so those are remain the same. And then um, the big change was to remove the foundational training around our three sets of content standards. So rather than making those required, um, they would be strongly encouraged. We still feel that these are really essential for effective instruction in Minnesota adult education, um, but managers could work with new staff to make a plan for um, completing those and which ones to complete and the, the timeline would be flexible. So again, thank you for providing your input. Our next step is to um, actually draft the policy and put it out for additional feedback. If you have other thoughts or questions that you'd like to share with our professional development team, please feel free to email me or call me. We can talk it through. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we are, we're running out of time and I don't think we're going to have time for the discussion that I had planned, um, but we did want to um, talk to this group about our professional development newsletter. So MNABE Connect goes out every Tuesday. Neil sends that out. Um, Marisa Giesler at Atlas compiles the newsletter in collaboration uh, with all of our support network providers. And this really is the one-stop shop to find out about upcoming events, deadlines, um, really great instructional information. And we have a new tech tip column. Um, we made the decision a number of years ago to consolidate all of the various communications that were coming out into one newsletter. Um, however, we're, we're really, as a statewide professional development committee, having some concerns that maybe people aren't 
um, reading their newsletters and therefore we're concerned that this critical information isn't getting out to folks. So we want to just um, put the question out there. Um, are, are you and your staff reading or opening the newsletter? We know that um, it is a, a really busy <laughs> every single day and it's hard to find the time. Um, we want to encourage folks to, to take just one to two minutes every Tuesday to, to skim through, find those things that are important, send them along to your staff, and think about what you can do to encourage your practitioners to just take those two minutes every week to skim the newsletter so we make sure that um, the information is getting out to them. So if you have suggestions, you can put them in the chat, and maybe we can revisit this conversation when we have a little more, more time. But please do read your newsletter. And seeing the, the positive uh, feedback coming in the chat, um, it sounds like many people are reading it and find, finding it useful. So, so I'm really glad to hear that. We are just about at time. Uh, we do have a few more professional development announcements. Um, so Neil, if you wanna just go to our um, final slide with the, the materials and Last web chat, make sure people have this information. If you do need to log off, we understand. If you can stay for another five minutes, um, uh, we can share some, some PD updates with you. But if you do need to go, the recording slides and handouts are going to be posted on the Literacy Action Network website. So, and Neil did put the, the slides in the chat. And then our next web chat will be on May 3rd. Um, from 1 to 2.30. And as we do every year, this will be our annual grant application webinar. So we'll have a little time for announcements, but most of the time we'll be going through that annual grant application for ABE funding. So um, if you do need to go, thank you for being here. If you can stay, um, I would love to share a little more information with you about professional development opportunities. So Neil, if you could go back to the teacher verification model slide. I'd appreciate it. Excellent, thank you. So um, as many of you know, we launched a new pathway um, for uh, distance learning, um, an opportunity to count proxy hours for asynchronous lessons that are verified by a TVM certified teacher. Um, up until this month, the, the one of the required steps in that certification process was participation in a live certification webinar. Um, the interest and registration numbers for those webinars has dwindled. I think a lot of the people who were interested in doing TVM have already been for the, through the certification process. So our team saw the need to provide a, another opportunity for people um, to get TVM certified. So as of February now, um, if you have teachers who are interested in getting certified, they can do that through an individual coaching process. Um, and the information about this new process is available on the Literacy Minnesota Distance Learning website. And then Neil's also put a link to yesterday's newsletter article that has some more information about that new option. So if you have teachers who are interested, you can check that out. On the next slide, I want to make sure that everyone saw the email that went out last year, uh, last yesterday, sorry, um, about a cohort that's being run through Literacy Minnesota around building an ed tech strategy toolkit. So this is a chance for teachers to work together with others from around the state virtually um, to explore and evaluate ed tech tools to be used either in person or in their online classes and to develop routines that they can use on a regular basis um, that integrate technology. So the application deadline has been extended until Monday actually, and the link to that application is in the chat. So if you have teachers who are interested in expanding their toolkit of and tech tools, uh, this cohort is for them. On the next slide, um, as you all probably know, there is now a cultural competency uh, relicensure requirement um, in our state statute. And for the past couple of years, Atlas has partnered with uh, Rose Chu and Andrea Eckelberger to offer a Pelsby approved ABE specific option for getting that uh, relicensure 
training. So that's coming up. It's a two-day training, both days required, February 10th and February 24th in the morning. Um, we've gotten really great feedback for that. Participants have a chance to work through some ABE-specific case studies. Uh, it's really relevant to our ABE settings. Also want to mention uh, the next webinar in our administrator webinar series, you'll have the opportunity to hear from several of your colleagues about five creative programming solutions um, that are working for them. We know that really the, the best form of professional development is hearing from your colleagues and hearing what's working in their settings. So join us on February 21st um, to hear from managers around the state about what's working for them in a variety of different areas. We are holding um, a series of evidence-based reading instruction webinars again this year. Those are coming up in uh, Fridays in February through May. So this is a chance for participants to learn about evidence-based reading instruction, the four reading components, diagnostic reading assessment, as well as um, incentives, routines, and resources for teaching the four components of reading. And our um, dear colleague, Marn Frank, is coming back out of retirement um, to, to facilitate these sessions alongside um, Minnesota practitioners who are using strategies in the classroom. It's going to be a great series. So I encourage folks to join us. I know that many of you have been through our CCRS cohort or other CCRS training. Um, we want to make sure that we're continuing to support um, the implementation of standards in your programs. So Atlas is offering a series of CSER support webinars. Next week, there'll be one that Christine Kelly is leading around text complexity, the what, the why, and the how. And then in April, a chance for you to learn about some updates that have been made to the uh, lesson and resource evaluation tools. This is a tool that you were introduced to during the cohort. Um, we've made some, some great changes, so come learn about how um, we can use these um, to evaluate lessons and instructional resources being used in the program. TIFF has gotten a refresh. Um, our uh, TIFF coordinator, our ACES coordinator and um, advisory team has been hard at work the first part of this year in adding some new lesson plans and resources and really um, bringing uh, the TIFF into um, 2023. So uh, there's a series of webinars for you to learn more about those changes and how you can use them in your program. The next slide, um, for those of you who have uh, math instructors looking for some professional development specifically for them. The MCTM, Minnesota Council of Teachers of Mathematics, um, is hosting their annual conference again this year. It will be in person in Duluth, and Atlas is going to be offering scholarships again. So keep an eye out in the February 14th newsletter for information about that. Um, the theme is mathematics for each and every one, and keynote talking about um, promoting mathematical thinking in classrooms. It should be an excellent event. We will be holding a statewide virtual conference again this year in lieu of in-person regional events. So this is a chance to gather with uh, folks from around the state to hear state updates. There'll be um, a variety of concurrent sessions, many of which will meet relicensure requirements, and then coffee breaks an opportunity to network with colleagues. So registration will be opening in March, so keep an eye out uh, in your newsletter for that registration. Looking ahead to summer, it will come. We, we have to believe that. And we'll have the chance to get together in person again in St. Cloud. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. There is a, a new venue, but still in the St. Cloud area. Uh, my colleague, Brandy Logan, will be our keynote speaker talking about her journey in adult education. The call for proposals is available now. Um, this is the primary um, event that is really driven by practitioner um, knowledge and expertise and networking. This is a chance for you and your teachers to share what's working in your program. So really encourage you to think about submitting a proposal, Think about um, 
things you've been hearing in the staff room or teachers that you've observed and give them that little nudge to share what's working for them with their colleagues. Um, the deadline for that is March 31st and registration will open in early May. And then finally, uh, just want to remind folks that we do have a refreshed and new North Star Digital Literacy Standards Integration uh, course, the North Star Foundations course that's available through Literacy Minnesota's online training portal. Um, North Star, we know that many people are familiar with the assessments, um, but may not know as much about the standards that underlie those assessments and the amazing um, technology and digital literacy integration instructional strategies that can be used. So we really hope that uh, teachers will take advantage of this op opportunity to learn about effective ways to build those standards into instruction. And with that, um, well, thank you again for joining us. I think our state team would be happy to stick around if there are additional questions about the professional development opportunities that I share or anything else um, that we shared during the webinar or didn't that you have questions about. And I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. If my colleagues didn't note something, please let me know. Okay, we've got a question for, uh, from Sherry, maybe um, Brandy and Brad can answer this question. Does it look like the MNGED 10 discount will be available through the entire year or will funds run out on this? Uh, thank you, this is Brandy on that. We have looked at our funds. We do get that uh, update monthly. And so far it looks like we should be fine throughout the rest of the year. Um, Brad, if you want to speak on um, any processes, if we look close to running low, but we are good right now. No, I would agree. We should, it should not run out this year. And I guess maybe I'll just add to that, Sherry. There is um, in the governor's budget um, the ability to uh, pay for one free test um, if that bill pass, if those bills pass. So that would actually change starting in July. We would probably no longer use the MNGED 10 code, but there might be a new code if there is a full subsidy available. Chair, I'm not sure I'm understanding what your comment is there about a decrease in support. Well, if they cover $10 off each test, that's a $40 level of support for every student. Yep. Assuming they're testing in person, but if they're only going to cover the cost of one test? No, sorry, one full battery. Oh, okay. Then please delete my former comment. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. I think, Wendy, we can end the recording. <laughs>